Hey, what's up guys? It's Hazard. So today we're gonna to be talking about the F-35. So if you've been reading the news lately, you've probably seen the F-35 coming under fire. Now all of that stemmed from an interview that General Charles Brown did, the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, with a group of defense writers. So I actually found that transcript. So we're gonna walk through it today and then you can decide if that was fair. All right, so first question. I wanted to ask about the F-16s. In an interview with Aviation Week a couple weeks ago, Dr. Roper mentioned that the Air Force was considering buying additional F-16s. I was wondering, more generally, the Air Force is thinking about balancing the F-35, F-15EX, maybe F-16, maybe NGAD. So NGAD is next generation air dominance. That's the Air Force's sixth generation fighter. All right, so here's some highlights from General Brown's answer. There's a need for fit gen capability. There's a need for NGAD and that particular capability to remain competitive against our adversaries. There's also a mix for a low-end fight. I don't know actually it would be F-16s. Actually, I wanna be able to build something new and different that's not the F-16 that has some of those capabilities but gets there faster using a digital approach. That TAC Air mix has to do some analysis to show that it's the right mix, not only in capability but also in numbers to assure that we are going to be successful in future conflicts. All right, so three things here. One, General Brown was asked specifically about F-16s. He was not asked about F-35s, so he gave an answer specific to the F-16. Second, it would be nice to have all fit-gen fighters. Fit-gen is the future, so fit-gen is the F-35, the F-22, but they are expensive, and we are gonna have fortune fighters like the F-16 and the F-15 until at least the late 2040s. So it's really a team mentality. And lastly, this is just a study. So there are dozens of studies going on all the time in the Air Force. So we're constantly trying to assess what are we missing? What is the next fight gonna be? And then adapting our force to be able to meet those demands. All right, next question. To follow up on this conversation around potentially buying more F-16s or something else, the something else sounds like, and maybe I misunderstood, you're talking about a clean sheet design. Should we be thinking about this like a clean sheet fourth generation fighter aircraft. General Brown, we need to have the right force mix. This is why I wanna do a TAC Air study. If I can do a clean sheet, that would actually be a jump in technology and realize the first time the F-16 flew was in the mid 70s. That's what we learned with our E-series approach to the T-7, what we learned with NGAD, open mission systems, being able to if I can actually have additional computing power and I can update code very quickly. Instead of waiting a year and a half, you could do this within a matter of minutes by updating the code on the airplane and particularly if you saw a new threat. All right, so the first thing to understand is that modern fighters have more in common with your smartphone than a traditional aircraft. So everything is software dependent and you wanna be able to update that software quickly. So you see that in Tesla, they can do an over there update and then now the car can accelerate faster, it can brake better. Same thing with aircraft. So with the F-35, with software, I remember back in 2017, we got a new software update. We could pull more Gs, it unlocked the gun. So this is important in combat because you're fighting an adversary that is thinking. So they are thinking, they are looking for vulnerabilities, and it's important that you shore up those vulnerabilities as soon as you find them. Likewise, if you see a vulnerability in an enemy, it's important that you adapt your systems to be able to take advantage of that. When fighting an adversary, seizing the initiative is the most important thing. So it's all about having quick decision cycles and that has to do with software here. Additionally, the F-16, that was designed back in the 70s. So the F-16, I had a chance to fly it for six years. It has 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s technology all intertwined. So it's really difficult to be able to have those quick software updates because every system doesn't talk to each other. There's been a digital revolution in the way we are designing aircraft. So we're replacing the T-38, so the trusted trainer that was built back in the 50s with the T-7. And so we used a digital approach to that. Same thing with NGED, that next generation air dominance fighter. And so this really comes down to three key new technologies. The first is agile software. So this is something that my wife works in. So she is a project manager in agile. And so it's about being able to iterate quickly and evolve rapidly. So instead of doing these long product life cycles of 10, 20 years, now you do two to five year life cycles and you could rapidly update and evolve what you're doing. This is because it's really difficult to forecast out the threat in combat to what we're gonna be facing in 25 years. It's much easier to find that threat five years out and be able to rapidly design 
a product for that. The second is an open software architecture. So in the past, a good example is going into space with like a satellite. So there's a lot of radiation in space and a what's called a bit flip can happen where that radiation causes a bit to flip and then now it's giving the wrong signal to the computer. So in the past, what they used was exotic hardware that was hardened to that radiation as well as one-off software that was designed for this. Now the problem with that was there was only a few thousand people in the world that could code for this specific hardware and software. So you didn't get a lot of talent in there. Now SpaceX came along and they use commercial off the shelf computers and they use three of them in parallel. And so these are non-hardened computers. They use C and C++. And so they run in parallel. And if there's a bit flip on one of the computers, the other two will outvote that computer. So without having radiation hardening, they were able to develop a system that was hardened to radiation. And the third key piece of technology is digital engineering. So we're able to forecast what that aircraft's gonna need from design all the way through implementation and sustainment. So this is important because you don't have to start at step zero. You're now starting at step three out of 10, which allows you to move a lot faster. All right, next question. How serious is the engine shortage from your standpoint? This is related to the F-35. And how does the F-35 fit into your accelerate change or lose action order? All right, so I thought I'd read a few highlights from this accelerate or lose action order because that's kind of our guiding star in the Air Force right now. So it's important that you understand that. So here we go. The world is changing in many ways. We now have an opportunity. If we don't change, we fail to adapt. We risk losing the certainty with which we have defended our national interests for decades. We risk losing a high-end fight. We must accelerate change now. The consequences of failure and success are profound. So if you look throughout history, if you lose a high-end fight, then often those countries are relegated to second-tier countries from then on. So you really get one chance to stay a superpower. So now the threats have moved to China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, violent extremists. So we're moving to a great power struggle as opposed to a counterinsurgency. Since Desert Storm, the US Air Force has enjoyed a historically anomalous period of dominance. These assumptions no longer hold true. So here's a quiz. When was the last time that a US soldier was killed by enemy air fire? So the answer was during the Korean War in the 1950s. So since the 1950s, U.S. soldiers, whenever they heard a plane flying overhead, they knew that it was not a threat. So that is huge. Air superiority is critical, and it's not a birthright. It's something that we have to work for. It's something that we have to plan for. And with aircraft taking a long time to build, it's something that we have to forecast for. Competitors, especially China, have made and continue aggressive efforts to negate long-enduring U.S. warfighting advantages and challenge the United States' interests. We are now seeing competitors outpace our current decision structures and fielding timelines. Air dominance is not an American birthright. So again, it goes back to the decision cycle. So being able to iterate quickly and move on, that allows you to seize the initiative and puts you at a tremendous advantage. Tomorrow's airmen are more likely to fight in highly contested environments and must be prepared to fight through combat attrition rates and risks to the nation that are more akin to the World War II era than the uncontested environment to which we have since become accustomed. Again, moving from that mindset of Iraq and Afghanistan to these high-end, highly contested environments. The 2018 National Defense Strategy and the Independent National Defense Strategy Commission both concluded that the international security environment is getting more competitive and dangerous with the return of great power competition and the erosion of US military advantages. Past success, is no guarantee of future performance. All right, so again, the world is changing. We need to be able to adapt. Other countries have adapted. They have fast fielding timelines, and that is putting us at a disadvantage now. Likely future budget pressures will require the most difficult force structure decisions in generations. We must reframe platform-centric debates to focus instead on capabilities to execute the mission relative to our adversaries. So this is something that plays out in the public all the time. People have an emotional connection to a certain platform, but it's not about platforms, it's about capabilities. This is something that General Deptula was able to do during the Gulf War. So it's not about having a cool aircraft to fly around, it's about effects. What are you trying to drive the other country to do? 
and working backwards from there. So in summary, this is saying that we need to change. You see history is littered with countries, with businesses that have gotten complacent and then been left in the dust. So it takes a long time to fuel the Air Force. You have to look out 10, 15, 20 years, not just two years, to be able to be relevant in the next fight. All right, so back to the engine discussion. In some cases, they're failing a little bit faster in certain areas, but it's also because of the high use rate. I wanna moderate how much we're using these aircraft. As I described, and here's the, I guess, infamous quote that's all over social media. It's like your Ferrari. You don't drive your Ferrari to work every day. You only drive it on Sundays. This is all high end. We wanna make sure that we don't use it all for a low end fight. And this just goes to show how effective the F-35 is. So every combatant commander wants it. Every other country wants it as a show of force. So right now we're wearing the engines a little bit faster than we would because we're using it a lot because everybody wants it to be forward deployed to their location. Fortunately, we're not in a major war, but that doesn't mean in 2035 that we don't go to war with a superpower. And you're gonna want that capability then. So you're not gonna want all that wear and tear on the airframe now when you know, 20 years down the road, you need every fifth gen fighter that you have. And to a second point that they're failing a little faster in certain areas, yeah, there's a little bit faster wear and tear. That's with any new technology. So it takes a while to iron out all the bugs. Every piece of technology has been down this road, but it's nothing catastrophic. We're still flying them. They're just wearing a little bit faster. And General Brown actually had a chance to address all these criticisms and set the record straight after the fact. Check it out. The reason I'm looking at this, this fighter study is to have a better understanding, not only what you know, the F-35s we're gonna get, but the other aspects of what complements the F-35. And I'm looking 10 to 15 uh, years out. Uh, and that's that's what the study's for. And really one of it's to, to really make me smarter so I can make better decisions or recommendations here in the department on how we look to the future. Because as I do our future design, I wanna be able to see where we think we need to go and how we get from where we are today to where we need to go into the future. So uh, the F-35 is cornerstone to, uh, to what we're gonna do. Uh, for the future of the Air Force. So what's the takeaway from all this? I think the first thing is that there are a lot of ignorant writers out there that are just trying to drive clicks. So they really don't know what they're talking about and they know that a sensational headline will draw a lot of clicks, especially with an emotional program like the F-35. The F-35 I've talked to before is really the first jet to grow up in the social media age. So it's really been a lightning rod for criticism. But if you look at the F-16's track record, Back when it was first coming out, there were years where one was crashing every two to three weeks. So imagine what social media would have done to the F-16 that has gone on to be one of the greatest fighters ever made. So if it's a website that doesn't deal with aviation-centric news, then I would just skip it. They're not gonna know what's going on. Aviation-centric news is gonna be slightly better. The best though is gonna be people with firsthand knowledge of what's going on. And with social media out there, General Brown's doing a lot of interviews. There's a lot of good information. There's actually, my favorite podcast lately has been the Aerospace Advantage podcast. And that's by the Mitchell Institute. So Billy Mitchell, he is the father of the Air Force. And he was actually court-martialed for his views that air power could sink battleships. And he was able to prove that. But the Mitchell Institute, they have a podcast, Aerospace Advantage podcast, and they have some great people on there. They have General Deptula, uh, John Warden's on there. So you really wanna to talk to people with firsthand knowledge of air power and air power strategy. So hopefully you enjoyed this, and I'll talk to you next time.